वैष्णव जन तो तेने कही वैष्णव जन तो तेने कही वैष्णव जन तो तेने कही जी पीड़ पारा जाने रे Greetings everybody and welcome to another episode of Nonviolence Radio. I'm your host, Stephanie Van Hook, and I'm here in the studio with my co-host and news anchor, Michael Negler for the Nonviolence Report, and we're from the Meta Center for Nonviolence. On today's show, we have the opportunity to speak with a very special person all the way from South Africa. She's a peace activist working tirelessly for the well-being of humanity all of her life, and she also happens to be the granddaughter of Mahatma Gandhi. Ila Gandhi is with us today. Thank you so much, Ila, for joining us today on Nonviolence Radio. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be uh, on this uh, program. You know, most people, when they hear your name, Ila Gandhi, they associate you right away with the work of your grandfather. But you yourself, your life has been so interesting and so rich that uh, I'd like to focus on getting, letting people get to know you as Ila first and how you've been working in in the field of nonviolence that's been inspired of course by your grandfather but how you've gone beyond it as well so you were born in phoenix settlement can you tell us a little bit about what what that place was and and, and what it meant to the the uh struggles in south africa so the phoenix settlement was set up by gandhi ji in 1904 mm. And it was a time when he decided that he needed to change his lifestyle. His thoughts were already changing over a period of time because when he came to South Africa, you know, he had um, a completely different outlook to life. He, uh, you know, was uh, quite, um, as a lawyer, he was status conscious. He was also, you know, a person who had a number of hang-ups about things, you know, uh, mm-hmm. about lifestyle and uh, about uh, what civilization should be and all that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But over a period of time, he began to realize that, you know, we are all equal. There's no status, you know. There shouldn't be Mm. this kind of hierarchy of status and all that. And he said, you know, a barber's work is as good as a lawyer's work. Uh, That was one of his uh, understandings by 1904. And then he also began to see that, you know, um, in uh, life, Living close to the earth is a very important thing. You know, the whole idea of food uh, security, uh, of growing your own vegetables, of becoming self-sufficient, of, uh, you know, living the kind of life that the poorest of the poor live. Mm. So he decided to move away from the city and live amongst the poverty-stricken people of the country. So, you know, on the one side, you have the sugar workers, those indentured workers who were brought from India. On the other side was a Shembe community, which was an African community, a religious uh, group that, you know, had a place over there. And then on the other side of the farm, uh, was the Dubey settlement, and Mr. Dubey was the first president of the um, ANC, and it was called the Native Council at that time, but uh, eventually it became the African National Congress. Mm. So he had an interesting, you know, boundary of people amongst whom he decided to go and look and to interact with these people and see, you know, what their struggles were and also to 
look at his own struggle in, you know, changing his lifestyle from a place where he had all the luxury to a place where there was no electricity, there was no running water, mm -hmm. there was no services whatsoever in that particular area. It was a completely rural community mm -hmm. with no services. And so, uh, you know, he had to begin to learn how to live in that situation. And that story is a very interesting story as to how he learned conservation. He learned about health, you know, looking at uh, healthy ways of living. He looked at, um, you know, the, the whole food issue, how food you know, the vegetarian diet that uh, he talked about, you know, before he left uh, for London, he had promised his mother that he wouldn't eat meat. And so his vegetarianism was sort of uh, vegetarian because it was compulsory, because he had promised his mother. But by the time he came to South Africa, it was uh, already uh, by conviction that he was a vegetarian, and he felt that that was a good way of living a healthy lifestyle. So at Phoenix, you know, these were the experiments, and then also about nature cure, you know, how you can uh, take care of little illnesses that people have. and use of clay soil to heal, the use of water as a healing mechanism, and things like that. So those were some of the experiments that he engaged in at Phoenix Settlement, and that is where I was born, uh, because he left that legacy for my father and my mother as well. And that's the lifestyle that my father and my mother engaged in. So when I was born, I grew into that particular ethos of uh, simplicity, of growing close to nature, and um, taking care of your health, and learning about self-sufficiency and that sort of thing. Uh, that's very, very beautiful, and I bet it was a, a very interesting childhood now, I, I read that your mother started a school at the ashram, and I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the the process of education and why you left the ashram school, for example. Okay, so my mother was a victim of what happened in India. She was from India, born in India. And uh, she, because, uh, you know, they boycotted uh, the English, School. So she, uh, you know, had to leave uh, soon after she was. She would have gone to high school, and uh, her parents said, you know, they decided that we're going to boycott these schools, and that was in the middle of the uh, nonviolent campaigns in India. So she valued the education and. Uh, my grandfather and my father supported her in um, her whole, you know, uh, her own learning process. And then also when she decided that she wants to impart education to the other children who don't have a school to go to, because at that time schools were limited in numbers and uh, many children did not have access to a school, to schooling, uh, particularly African children, but also Indian children. And so she just uh, started this in a little room, thinking that she'll get about 10, 15 people and be able to teach them. But before long, she had like 300 children and had no accommodation. <laughs> And then they discovered, you know, then the eyes of the government fell on the school. And the government said that you can't teach African children. 
because there's, uh, you know, they had segregation in, in schooling. So they had to opt for an Indian school because Indians could only run an Indian school. They couldn't have an African school. And so they had to opt for that. And that was a great disappointment for her because she had a really good, you know, group going in this building, which was a really small building. Of course, it uh, was too inadequate for so many children. But the fact that, you know, the children were there and then also the fact that, you know, girls, uh, should be uh, educated. They should have access to education. And the whole idea of um, equality between the genders and all that, those were some of the things that my father had learned. And, you know, um, my mother was also quite a strong person. And so, you know, as uh, she lived at Phoenix, she grew into this uh, whole ethos of equality, gender equality, uh, education for girls, and uh, so on. So that was one of the motivations for her to run the school. And of course, my father supported her in all those things. They worked together as a team. She, you know, worked in the printing press, which was... Uh, quite a hectic affair because, you know, everything, it was a weekly newspaper that used to be brought out, but the printing, and we printed it, not just published or, you know, uh, put it together, but we actually did everything at Phoenix Settlement. Mm. And every alphabet had to be put together to make sentences. So this was a really manual printing Output at Phoenix Settlement. And she learned everything about it and knew exactly how to run the whole place. And for many years after my father passed away, she continued with the place and running the Phoenix Settlement. And your your father was Manilal uh, Gandhi, Gandhi's uh, second? My second son, second yes. Second son. Now, I, I, for our listeners, what I'd like them to understand about nonviolence is that this is more than just starting schools, right? This is more than just having a newspaper. What was this is what we call a nonviolence constructive program, right? Building yeah. the alternatives when the uh, yeah. system is corrupt, when there is when there's something broken about the system. Instead of resisting it, you build the alternative, and and I wonder. If you could speak to that a little bit more about what constructive program, therefore, means to you as somebody who grew up as helping to perpetuate it, as helping to to grow it. Yeah, so um, at Phoenix Settlement, you know, we encourage people to do their own um, growing of vegetables and so on. So that was one way in which people became self-sufficient. Um, also, you know, little skills uh, to to make them, you know, less uh, dependent on, uh, you know, the mainline economy. Mm -hmm. So this is building up your own economic, uh, you know, um, activity so that you become self-sufficient, so that you're not dependent on the people who are actually exploiting you. Mm -hmm. That's the one thing. The second thing is that you are not supporting the exploitative mechanism by becoming uh, independent or dependent on yourself rather than on these uh, economic giants, you know. You're kind of um, making a statement and also 
showing that because at the end of the day, they depend on us as consumers. And if we stop consuming what they produce, it makes them think and it makes them reassess what they are doing. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the ways in which one uh, indicates to people that we are unhappy about the way you are doing things. Mm -hmm. So that can only be done if you if you engage in this kind of constructive program and build your own economic or economy, uh, which can then be, uh, you know, uh, resist the mainline economy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Today we see that there's a lot of interconnectedness, but yet there is a lot of exploitation. And that exploitation needs to be resisted. And I think that even now, today, we can begin to look at self-sufficiency and things like that. Gandhiji was very much influenced by this idea of the kibbutz. And although kibbutz, you know, are a small sort of, um, they haven't grown into huge settlements that can influence the world. But it is a model that uh, that the world can follow. And if we uh, build up that kind of a model, we can uh, build a society that is more equity than there is at the present moment. It's the inequality that is the bane of uh, modern life. Vaishnav Janato Tene Kahiye Je Peed Parai Jaane Re For those of you just tuning in, we're speaking with Ila Gandhi all the way from South Africa. Uh, Ila happens to be the granddaughter of Mahatma Gandhi, and she is a peace activist and scholar in her own right for nonviolence. So we're very happy to have her. Ila, as you, as you speak of your, your time in Gandhi's first ashram, Phoenix Settlement, and, and some of his influences and, and, and the values, uh, I'm I'm struck by the idea that it could be challenging uh, for people to come together and live together in these settings, in ashram settings, in kibbutz settings. Uh, what has your experience been that makes those kinds of environments work? Because even though the, you know, coming together and, and wanting to live in a self-sufficient way is is an ideal when we come in. We're human beings with our own problems and our own uh, personalities and drawbacks. Can you speak a little bit to what it's like living in those situations and, and what helps keep your eyes on the higher goal? Well, I think the biggest problem is the materialism that has overtaken the world. Mm. Today in the modern, modern world, people have become more and more materialistic. Human values are seen as secondary to the materialistic values. So people's uh, wants have increased, you know, they um, want access to so many different things. I mean, I was talking to somebody today and uh, we have a lot of unemployment and we were trying to set up a program whereby we could help some of the communities uh, who were suffering from, you know, poverty and deprivation and see if we can get uh, food and things to them. And when we discuss the issue of what would you like to have, some of the things they talked about was cosmetics. 
And, you know, we were just thinking, look, uh, food is essential, but are cosmetics really essential, especially when you suffering, you know, when you are trying to sort of bring out, you know, the human nature in people to offer, you know, um, food security to other people. If we were to go and tell them that, look, we need cosmetics for the community, are they going to give you that sort of thing? Are they going to take you seriously, you know? So that's the kind of materialism that has overtaken all of us. And on the other hand, flip side of the coin is that if you are poor, why is it that uh, it's wrong for you to want cosmetics? Are cosmetics only for the rich people? Mm. So this is, you know, the other argument. And in between lies a whole, you know, lot of ideas that are based on Gandhian ideas of simplicity, of being able to look at the nature's, you know, what nature has given us and to see how it can be equitably distributed. Mm -hmm. Because if what we have, the resources we have are equitably distributed, everybody will have a chance to live a good life, a good, healthy life. It's because there's a skewed uh, distribution where some have too much and others have nothing. Now, to redistribute that, one has to find a mechanism. And within that mechanism, at present, they can't be placed for cosmetics. Somebody had asked Gandhiji once, you know, when he started the uh, spinning wheel, they told him that, look, you know, this cotton uh, that we weave out of hand-spun cotton, uh, the cloth that we weave is a very thick and, um, you know, it's not a, the kind of cloth that we would want to wear in the hot weather in India. Whereas, you know, the one that's made uh, uh, from machines is a lighter cloth and it's uh, cooler to wear and things like that. So Gandhi's answer to this person was that you can, by learning how to spin properly, you can begin to spin a very fine thread and produce a beautiful fine cloth. It just means learning and practicing to be able to perfect your art. Because at the end of the day, it's an art. The spinning is an art. Weaving is an art. And you can produce the most beautiful cloth. You don't have to have a machine to produce the beautiful cloth. So that was Gandhiji's answer. And what I'm saying is that there shouldn't be, you know, certain things that are only available to the rich and poor have no access to them. The poor also uh, can have access to things, you know, that um, like cosmetics and so on. Uh, I don't know. I don't think Gandhiji ever liked cosmetics. He said, God has given you a beautiful face. Why do you have to apply other things on that face? People want these things, and you can't tell them, look, uh, you know, the rich people can have it, and you are poor, so you can't have it, you know? There's some sense of dignity when when people have can have what everybody can have or what what has been denied to them. 
And but you, what I hear you saying is we need to really reevaluate what gives us dignity and not just the imitation of materialist values, but how do we turn back to human values? And, and you really connected that with the earth, with uh, our basic needs and it, how silly it is for us to base our dignity on materialist needs and how we can change that conversation. And I also hear you saying that in a way, human beings absorb the values of those around them. We are we are almost like sponges and you know, the materialism affects all of us because we're we're just we're soaking in it all of the time. So spaces that are like intentional communities and and ashrams and kibbutz uh are opportunities to absorb different kinds of values which can then help change society. And uh, yeah. that, you know, if we come in as imperfect human beings, just like spinning and weaving, these are arts and we can we can make with these values a kind of an art. They can become finer and more subtle and uh, more powerful the more we we treat it like an art, not as something that either we we do well or we fail at. And uh, I think yeah. your life models that in so many ways. And I've also heard you say in a talk or in a book that I, I read about you that you you applied this as well to to children's education, that something about if children just simply had compassionate adults around them that modeled compassion for them, yeah. then society yeah. would look very different. Can, can you speak uh, to that a little bit about uh, about that kind of true education? Yeah, uh, so in, uh, you know, from my perspective, from what I've read and understood, children learn more from watching than from being told. If uh, teachers tell them, look, uh, smoking is bad, for instance, and then they are smoking, the child is likely to learn smoking. Uh, because, you know, even if you tell them that it's bad, they have seen the teacher smoking. So how can it be bad, you know? That is how children would think and um, and learn. So they learn from watching and seeing their peers, that educators, you know, their peers in school uh, and so on. And uh, from each other as well, and from the family, parents, and so on. If they grow up in an environment where there's a lot of violence, and this is what we are seeing in South Africa at the moment, that many of the children are exposed to domestic violence and uh, violence in the community and so on. And so when they grow up, they also believe that violent ways are the only ways in which they can survive. You know, they can't survive without violence. So, uh, yes, absolutely, uh, we have to, you know, have people who would be examples themselves. And this is what we've been teaching. Uh, we ran programs with particularly the uh, early childhood learning period, because that is the period when the child's basic understanding of life is developed in the first 10 years of the child's life. Those uh, years in preschool and in family school are very important, and that is the time when one needs to have really good teachers who can impart good values. And that doesn't happen through lecturing. It happens through example. So, yeah, this is what we've been telling the teachers, and not just telling them, but uh, showing them how this is important and mm. how children can learn if the teachers are not careful about how they conduct themselves within that environment. 
So if, for instance, in an early childhood uh, setting, if there's a lot of friction amongst the teachers themselves, the children see this and they see that, uh, well, you know, shouting at each other, you know, hitting out at each other, bad language, bad communication, all those things, they learn. They learn from the way the teachers behave. So that's why it's important for them to um, behave differently in the schools. And we found that, you know, there was a tremendous change in the whole atmosphere in a school after we had had those discussions with the teachers and um, the training program that we imparted in the school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And, and to transition a little bit uh, uh, to get a fuller picture of your life, Ila, I'd, I'd love to go in a little bit to how your, your anti-apartheid activism, because as I hear you talking about these, these values and how you lived, uh, the fact that you were banned from political activism and you were under house arrest, uh, can, you, can you speak to that, that time in your life and, and, and what it was like to, to live under apartheid and how you participated in, in helping to heal that so in I some way. So I think that what we are experiencing at the moment in a small way tells you what our life was like because of the lockdown conditions and the COVID, uh, you know, regulations sort of restrict your movement, your communication, your, you know, social life and all those things. Well, that's exactly what happened to us by force. And by force of an order uh, from the Ministry of Justice, rather than because nature, you know, determined that there's going to be a COVID uh, outbreak that uh, one needs to confront, which is what's happening at the moment. But uh, one can see how difficult life is under lockdown. And uh, that is uh, what our life was like under lockdown. Uh, we couldn't go out. And I'm saying we because my husband was also under house arrest uh, during that time. Both of us were banned and both of us were under house arrest. And our children grew up under those conditions. So, uh, you know, it was a very, very difficult uh, time. We couldn't, um, you know, participate in that. the school activities that our children were participating in. We couldn't go to the school. You're not allowed to enter a school. If we had to admit a child to a school, you know, in the first year, we couldn't ourselves enter that school. We had to get special permission to say that, look, as parents, we have to go and sign documents in the school. Give us the permission to go to the school. And then with the permit, we were allowed to go into the school. Otherwise, you're not allowed to enter school premises. Mm. And uh, from, uh, you know, a certain time in the evening, like we have curfews under lockdown at the moment, we had to, you know, be indoors from a certain time in the evening to a certain time in the morning. It was like 7 o'clock in the evening to 7 o'clock in the morning. We couldn't leave the house, mm. no matter what the emergency but I heard you did leave the house. Well, sometimes, you know, one takes a chance. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, because that is not uh, like the peasant, as I said, you know. This is uh, 
uh, nature's way of telling us, you know, you have to uh, have the uh, lockdown conditions or else you're going to be, you know, getting uh, COVID or infected by the coronavirus. At that time, it was the Minister of Justice. Mm -hmm. So we would readily violate Minister of Justice's uh, conditions, mm -hmm. but not the conditions of nature, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that makes a difference. That's uh, an interesting lesson that deserves more more discussion. But it seems sort of seems like a theme going back to the respect for nature and human values. One of our questions for you as well is whether you know were you did you participate in any of the work of um, during that transition of the truth and reconciliation processes and if as a peace activist and as a member of parliament, if you felt that they were effective? Well, um, we drew up the whole law that, uh, you know, enables the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to function. So I was in parliament. I didn't participate in the working of the con uh, commission, but we drew up the laws and the regulations to to say how that you know all, uh, commission should be working and what they should be doing and that sort of thing. How they go about the work that they do and what are some of the um, you know factors that need to be taken into account. So that was uh, something that we did. We had to do extensive study of other such, uh, you know, initiatives in other countries. We weren't the first ones to put in that, you know, that kind of uh, regulation. So we had to do that study of others and uh, study what went wrong in some of the other and what worked in some of the other initiatives. And then draw up ours. But now, in hindsight, we see that ours wasn't perfect either, that there are a lot of things that we omitted from our legislation, like, uh, you know, the um, whole issue of um, reparations, of restorative justice, those kinds of issues needed to be better understood and better planned so that communities could, you know, uh, benefit from that kind of thing. And and communities would accept, you know, the most important thing I think that I learned from being in Parliament is that you can make laws, but if the community is not happy about the law and they don't accept it, then definitely you're going to have a lot of violations of the law. And the law will be just on paper. The community will be violating it daily. Mm -hmm. So therefore, the support of the community for every law and every regulation is important. And one can get it. You just have to work hard. You have to go into your constituency and explain why certain things are necessary. People need to understand. People can also tell you that why do you have to do it this way and not the other way. And then you suddenly realize that there is another way of doing the same thing. And so discussion with the community is very important. And yeah, in the first five years, I think we had a lot of discussion with communities, uh, both on uh, writing up the new constitution and in the many laws that we passed during that time. But after that, it was a question of delivery where we, I think, hopelessly failed. And that's why we are in the uh, terrible position that South Africa finds itself in at the moment, 
with the inequality is so high, unemployment rate is so high. After 25 years, there are people who still don't have access to uh, basic necessities of life, such as water, food, uh, education, health care, housing. I mean, those are things that we should have provided mm. to everyone. Mm. Ila, thank you so much for your time today. I, Michael Negler is here in the studio with me, and he will be uh, with you on October 1st. So he wants to say hello and ask you a question before you go. <laughs> that is quite correct. Hello, Ila. How are you? Very well, thanks. And you? Fine, thank you. Yeah. Ila, while we've got you in this setting, I, I've been burning to ask you a question. You spoke so well about the economic sufficiency that was striven for and mostly achieved at Phoenix. And I'm wondering if we can transfer some of those practices and some of those values from the economic field to the conflict field. Uh, and the reason I raise this is we have communities in this country which uh, have become dependent on police force for their domestic tranquility just as the nation as a whole has become dependent on a, a you know quite powerful military force for its peace, w was there an implicit escape from that in the experiments that you were doing at Phoenix? Yes, absolutely. You know, in, when I was growing at Phoenix, we had no fences. They were, our property wasn't fenced. There was a property that Gandhiji had bought, 100 acres of land. Nobody would violate the borders. But everything was shared. We had a little river. We had a well, underground uh, a borehole, where people could come and get water. And our neighbors came and, uh, you know, uh, used the water that was on our property. So there was no kind of uh, ownership of the nat natural resources. But when we grew vegetables and things like that, nobody would come and steal. They would uh, realize that, okay, if you can grow the vegetables, we can also grow on our side of the land. Why do we have to go and steal it from them? And that was the kind of... Uh, you know, understanding and lifestyle that people lived at that time. So we we had a beautiful life at Phoenix until, you know, the um, 70s and 80s when the government began to bring in large uh, numbers of people into the area and, you know, just changed the farm into housing schemes. And that, uh, you know, then led to a lot of strife. And ever since then, I mean, Phoenix was burnt down in 1985, instigated by apartheid forces. So um, those were some of the, you know, limitations that we experienced from the 70s, and we haven't been able to return to the um, a more agrarian kind of society. We are trying now, uh, you know, with the community, we've built up a good relationship with our neighborhood, and we are trying to, uh, you know, encourage food gardens and so on. So those are small projects that we are trying to um, to build up again. But it's not on the larger scale that Gandhiji had in mind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ila. One last question, I guess, and we don't have much time, but did 
Gandhiji and the others consciously carry over the lessons learned and the values acquired at Phoenix into the larger social struggles that began in 1906 with the first Satyagraha campaign. Yes, absolutely. Uh, those values were and that's why Tolstoy Farm was built as well. In 1910, you know, they acquired a piece of land in Johannesburg, and another ashram was developed there. But then uh, Gandhiji himself, you know, after a year, at Tolstoy Farm returned to Phoenix, and, um, you know, Tolstoy Farm was closed because... Uh, there were difficulties. It was very far from the from the city, and um, Gandhiji had to, you know, come back to the Natal province, and so those were some of the difficulties uh, which Tolstoy Farm had. Mm. But at Phoenix, uh, the values were taken forward, and many. People who lived at Phoenix, you know, grew with those values and have taken them into the larger community. Mm. So, yeah, there is. Uh, it's not very visible because most Gandhians work quietly. They don't make a big noise about what they are doing and so on. People don't hear about them. And so, yeah, we don't see, uh, you know, but what is going on worldwide. I think uh, the very fact that you have an ashram there, I think, um, you know, your found, um, you know, Ignati, uh was definitely influenced by Gandhian ideas. Yes, and our work at the Meta Center for Nonviolence is also uh, very based in, in Gandhian values and ideals, and we're just so grateful to have you on Nonviolence Radio. I'm sorry, we're out of time, and I wish that this could go on. For those of you just tuning in, we've been speaking with Ila Gandhi all the way from South Africa. Ila, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, and all the best wishes to all of you, the listeners, and yourself. Tiffany and uh, Michael G. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. So <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Michael Nagler with the Nonviolence Report, and today uh, I'm going to do something rather special. I'm going to make a statement about the uh, events of 9-11, which are being remembered around the world. So, you know, 20 years ago, I wrote the pamphlet, Hope or Terror, to point out the strange coincidence that on the same date, almost a century earlier, Gandhi had launched Satyagraha, Nonviolence at the Empire Jewish Theater in Johannesburg, South Africa. That was September 11th, 1906. So I call them signposts for two paths that can be taken by the human race, violence or nonviolence. We know what path the world seems to have chosen. Yet on the day before he died, Martin Luther King warned a packed church audience in Memphis that the only real choice is, quote, nonviolence or non-existence. And that only becomes clearer with the march of events from then to now. There are hopeful signs, I'm glad to report, uh, along with the endless march of war that the United States has undertaken since 1945, there's also been a steady global rise of nonviolence not just as a tool for national liberation, as Gandhi used it, 
but in seemingly inexhaustible applications to human betterment at every level from the individual to the global. And it just amazes me how nonviolence seems to carry with it a solution for every problem that violence throws across our path. You could ask yourself, what is terrorism after all? An acute sense of separateness from others, right? Leading to alienation from the universe and from oneself, a cry of despair from a heart of helplessness. Yet there's nothing more empowering that can happen to a human being than to discover the seed of nonviolence hidden within us. As I found in my limited experience, this discovery, which is inspiring enough in itself, also makes it unmistakable that what we're discovering is not our private possession. It is the human inheritance. When we draw closer to others on a deep level, even as we're discovering this tool for saying no to their hurtful behavior, we are not negating their humanity. On the contrary, when we, quote, offer satyagraha, as Gandhi put it, we are offering the erstwhile opponent a way to stop hurting us, which means to avoid their own moral injury, however little they may be aware of it at first, and break down their alienation. In a word, to rediscover their own dignity in the process. In fact, the word used for nonviolence when the Philippine people rose up to expel the dictatorship of Ferdinand Marcos in 1986, this is the famous People Power Revolution, their word for nonviolence was aloy dangal, offering dignity. Violence hurts both ways, the perpetrator as well as the victim. Well, nonviolence also operates in both directions, but with the opposite effect, to heal and reconcile, to elevate humanity to that extent every time we use it. Of course, how to use it isn't so simple. A lot of subtlety builds around that core simplicity and a lot of struggle, but one that is worth it, supremely worth it, not just for ourselves, but for our world, our planet, and our future. Tene kahi je peed parai jaane re Well, you've been listening to Nonviolence Radio. I'm Stephanie Van Hook. Michael Negler is with me. We want to thank our guest, Ila Gandhi, for joining us all the way from South Africa. We want to thank our mother station, KWMR, to Matt Watrous, Annie Hewitt, Brian Farrell, all of you, our listeners, all the supporters of the Meta Center for Nonviolence, everybody out there. Until the next time, let's practice nonviolence. Deep in the